Welcome everybody. Welcome to the Centre for South Asian New Lecture Series. Um, I'm Lali Kudibron, for those who don't know me, I'm the Associate Director. And um, I'm not going to spend a long time introducing the speaker today because he's the Director of the Centre for South Asia and I think he really is someone who needs no introduction. So I'm just going to say a few words, but before I do that, um, I would like to remind you of the last lecture of this uh, semester, which is going to be two weeks, on the next week being Thanksgiving. Uh, on Thursday, December 1st, we have Shelley Feltman coming to speak to us. She's president of the American Institute of Bangladesh Studies, and she's also the director of uh, the Feminist, Gender, and Sexuality Studies um, at Cornell University, where she's a professor of development sociology. Uh, the title of her talk on December 1st is Constructing States and Citizens, Partition as a Social Project. Uh, so please come and join us for that two weeks from now. Um, all I want to say about Mark, because you really uh, know him and you know much about the research, and he's one of the most generous people I've ever met. Um, on the whole, that makes me happy, makes me happy as a person. Uh, sometimes when I have to sign up on some of our expenses, it doesn't make me quite as happy, but on the whole, we, uh, we, uh, we keep things under control. No, I'm kidding. Um, but Mark looked at our schedule and, and saw that we had a little bit of a slot open and there was some scope here for a lecture. And he said, well, I did some interesting research recently. Uh, I'll come give a talk. And I know how busy Mark is, because often I try and get hold of him. And, um, He's always running around helping someone or other. So I'm so grateful to you that you found time to prepare a slideshow and a presentation for us. So just please join me in thanking Mark and I. Well, today's talk, um, if we can get the lights off, is something I've been working on since 1981. And it's just kind of decided I figured it's time to talk about it again. Um, I got my job here because I gave a talk relating to this stuff, but I think only Joe Elder and Usha Nielsen would remember my job talk. It was a great talk. Yeah. So um, most of you probably have never heard some of the stuff that I'm going to be presenting today unless you've taken some of my classes and you may have heard a little bit of it. But I have been working on my dissertation research ever since I first started it and continuing to do work. In fact, I spent 25 years excavating at Harappa, trying to get more shell data to see if my dissertation thesis was in fact um, confirmed or not. And I've been trying to put that data together to follow up with the initial uh, ideas that I had in my dissertation. I'm not going to present that data today because it's still not ready, but mm -hmm. I thought it would be uh, an opportune moment to kind of review some of the uh, information on the end of civilization, and I've learned some really neat things this, this last couple of years, uh, and especially this, this last year, uh, which um, shed some new light on some of the things that I began working on as a graduate student. So um, we'll start with thanking George Dales for inviting me to Pakistan to work in at the site of Balakot, where I first started playing with shells and shell industries. And then all my colleagues in India, Pakistan, Europe, and the U.S. who've shared data, helped me along the way, and given me new ideas to think about. And I especially want to thank the Department of Archaeology, Government of Pakistan, and the Department of Archaeology, uh, Archaeological Survey of India, for their help, and all the people who worked at Harappa. And also the funding agencies. Thank you. Um, most of you are familiar with the Indus civilization and the fact that it emerges at a time when we see other major urban societies uh, developing in uh, West Asia and in East Asia. Uh, the periods during this, this, this urban process itself is very complex and I'm not going to talk about it today, but one of the, the important uh, trade items and tech, uh, commodities that was being traded and developed as an important symbol of power relates to shell. And shell, it turns out, is one of the earliest forms of ornament that's ever produced by humans. It goes back to 30,000 to some, in plus some places 150,000 years that people picked up shells, put holes in them, and wore them around their neck. So shell is one of the oldest examples of an item that has been used for symbolic purposes and was traded from great, for over great distances in the Paleolithic period and also into this early urban phase. So it's not surprising that Shell has an important role in the interactions between um, Indus Valley and other regions. 
I'm not going to go into great detail of that external trade. I want to focus mainly on the development within the Indus of Shell Industries. And, uh, but there will be some discussions of, of links to other areas. The major species that we're talking about are, I'm focusing on marine not as opposed to um, riverine shell. There are many shells that people call conches, and I didn't get all of them on here. There's one other called Fascularia trapezium, which I didn't have a photo of, or easily accessible. Um, Lambus truncata CB is a uh, five or fingered conch, and it's found in the areas of the Persian Gulf. Um, it's also uh, very thick and heavy, and can be used for making lots of different types of artifacts, which I'll show you shortly. Um, Buchefala, M. Buchefala, is also a uh, whelk type of conch. Uh, it has a nice big spiral, but it doesn't get very big. It's relatively small. Uh, the most important one for South Asia, and actually for most of the old world, is Turbinella pyrum, or as my Italian colleagues say, Turbinella pyrum. Okay, so whenever I said, when I gave lecture in Italy, I got yelled at for not pronouncing it right. So, um, so this uh, conch shell, or sacred shank, uh, shank, as we say it in India, the name shank actually comes from a Dravidian word, changu. So the original name for shank in modern Dravidian, uh, non-Dravidian languages is derived from a Dravidian root word. So Indo-Aryan speakers borrowed shank from changu, which is a Dravidian word in the, in the modern terminology. Xancus pirum is an old Latin name for it, so they used to call it xancus which comes from shunk too, so that's an older um, borrowing of that, uh, the, that term. You'll notice that the spirals of these shells all go from turn around and end up with a hole on the bottom right hand side of the shell. If the, the top of the shell is called the apex, so if that's pointing to the top of your slide, the hole is on your right. So this is called a, uh, the, the right spiraled conch shell. There are conch shells in the New World which go the other way. And if you go down to the coast in New Orleans or go down to the Caribbean, you'll find ones that turn the other way. They're very thin shells. They don't have a thick shell. And they are sold in India, and I'll tell you about it a bit, a bit later. But this shell is normally is extremely heavy. It's very thick, has a strong central column. And um, just picking it up, you can feel it's, it's a lot of value. It's just a heavy, heavy shell and turns generally to the right. Other species, and I don't, I'm not throwing all of them in here, you have cowries, and the cowrie shells that were used in antiquity are not the monetas cowrie that was used in the medieval period and the early historic period. So most cowries that you see in the ancient period don't have a crenellated top and a yellow top. They have a kind of a dome, and those are the cowries that are found throughout the Indian Ocean except for the Maldives. And the Maldives are where you find the monetas kauri, which came to be used in medieval trade as a form of money. And that doesn't come in until much later. We have lots of cone shells and various other types of small gastropods with various designs. These were used extensively by early civilizations in ornaments. And here's a fragment of a large shell that is um, known as pinctada. And it's a, it's a mother of pearl shell. It's the shell that has pearls. It's also found in the Persian Gulf, in the areas um, of the Makran coast, but nowhere else except till you get to South India, uh, and possibly a little bit in Kutch. So Kutch, uh, air, the region of Kutch, the Makran coast, and the Gulf, uh, Persian Gulf, and then very far in the south. Uh, this shell also was used for making ornaments, and we assume that pearls were collected, but pearls are very fragile, and they don't preserve archaeologically. Uh, my, uh, the summary based on my re research with, on, the, on the, Indus shell the, the shell industries of the Indus civilization is a map that shows the major trade networks that emerged from use of shell because each species of shell has a limited distribution from where it's found. And I focus primarily on those species that, that are not found everywhere but are only found in certain locations. So Turbinella pirum was found in the region of Kutch. Some species are found in the Gulf of Kambat. There are no species found in the delta of the Indus because of the silt. And then they are found along the coast, possibly as far as Dasht River, which is the furthest west, furthest west Indus settlement 
that has ever been found on the Dasht River, just on the border of Iran and um, Pakistan. No Turbinella pyrum have been found in the Gulf area on the other side, and none of them are found until you get down to the South India, into the very far south along the Cochin coast, and then Kanyakumari and the Palk Bay and Manar Bay in the south. So Turbinella pyrum that was used in antiquity was all coming from Kutch or Makran, two sources. Other species, Lambus truncata CB, can be found in the regions of Kutch. Murex is found over here. There, some of them are found over here as well. And by tracing these, we were able to, I was able to reconstruct major trade networks. And I'll talk briefly about them here, but I, and I'll come back to them again. So major species that were collected for industry were taken directly from the coast, reprocessed in these coastal areas, and then partially finished goods or finished goods were taken all the way up river to major cities like Mohenjo-daro and Harappa. Some of them were reprocessed there and then sent on further. Some of the finished goods were arriving there in finished form. Cowrie shells, conus shells, all the variety of species that you see along the coast, most of them are not found in the northern sites because they're just, they peter off and they, 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 you don't get that much variety in the northern sites. So we can see a direct exchange from the coast to big cities. People use the sites there and then the, the rarer species like cowrie and cone shells are not traded further. So conch, conch shell or turbinella pyrum is one of the only species that's traded further to the north. Uh, there is one other species called murex, which I'll talk about. That's also traded over great distances. And it, um, there's, there's a, um, slightly different trade networks for that. The, tra the period of time that I want to cover in today's talk starts with basically the period of the early food producing era, the Neolithic period, when we see the first settlements happening in the Indus Valley. Uh, we don't have any shell preserved from Paleolithic sites, though I think people were probably collecting them. And then I'll talk briefly about the regionalization period when we have uh, small cities and towns developing. And then the most focus will be on the Harappan phase, the integration era, when we have the emergence of large uh, cities throughout the Indus Valley. Based on work at the site of Mehrgar, which I'll explain in a minute, the trade networks that I was able to define for shell during the earliest uh, Neolithic phase of the Indus Valley is, uh, is that there were two trade networks. One was coming along the mountains from the coastal areas up to the plains in Baluchistan and then down from there into the Indus Valley. The other one was coming up the Indus Valley directly to sites through the Indus region. So it suggests that there were two parallel trade networks bringing materials from the coast inland. And this is based on the type of shell and the types of manufacturing debris found. Um, since my work at Mehargar, this region has never been accessible for much research, so we don't really have any new data, though some of my Pakistani colleagues are collecting information from here <coughs> that suggests that there were some early sites, um, other sites that have shells, so that it's not just, they're not just going to Mehargar, but they're dropping off along the way, and that there are shell objects all along this route. In contrast, you'll see that turquoise is coming from Iran down to this region, and lapis is coming from the north. And so from the very earliest phase, we knew that there were two major trade networks coming from the north and one from the south intersecting in the Indus Valley. And the Indus Valley itself is the area where we have an overlapping of these. So rock can be traced f along its roots, and shell can be traced along its roots. And you f see through these overlapping networks a very um, important uh, larger scale trade pattern that links the highlands of Central Asia all the way to the coast. And we do have shell from the coast all the way into the Central Asian republics and buried with some of the elite burials. The site of Mehargar, uh, dating from about 7,000 or 6,500 to 5,500 BC during the early phase, is a crossroads of trade. It's at the base of a pass and people are moving back and forth through this site settlement. There's no major city emerging here, but we have large um, houses that may have been storerooms, and people came there periodically to live, and then moved away probably in different seasons. But one thing they did do at Mehargar was bury their dead there. And bur in their burials, which we also know that were happening in the mountains, so there have been looted burials from Baluchistan that have similar uh, materials, we have evidence for a wide variety of ornaments, including lapis and turquoise, 
but also lots of shell beads, and these are micro beads made from a spondylus shell, uh, a type of clam found on the Macron coast. There are also small um, uh, beads with brown and white bands that are found on the Macron coast, also found here. This shell bangle, however, is one that's found probably through the trade along the Indus, and it's the Turbinella pyrum bangle made from a single large shell. The technology for shell making at this time was basically chipping and grinding. So they ground shells, they chipped them, they uh, polished them. They don't, we don't have any evidence of bronze saws being used. So they were using stone tools and grinding technology to produce them. And since these are found in burials, we can assume that they had some kind of ritual significance as well as economic value and um, ideological value. And uh, the burials themselves are filled with uh, a, wi a wide range of ornaments, anklets, necklaces, bangles, and then headbands made of, of tiny beads. Uh, in somewhat later periods, we start seeing figurines, which are wearing bangles as well. Unfortunately, their, her arms are underneath her breasts, so you can't see the arms, but these figurines do have bangles. And they also have evidence for red um, marks in their forehead and on their, uh, in the part of their hair, which in later times is associated with marriage status in South Asia. And this is a woman from Bengal who's wearing shell bangles. And she also has this shindur in the middle of her par part of her hair. And when I first began looking at shell bangles, one of the things that kept coming to my mind was, what do shell bangles mean for the ancient Indus people? Do they relate to a marriage status situation for women? Uh, we know that they were also worn by men. Uh, or used, shell was used by men, but we, I, I began to think of this as an important thing to look for and see if I could test and study. Um, moving on to the phase of Harappa and the early, or the Cotdigian phase, the regionalization period, we see many sites in the Indus Valley with shell materials, which indicates that materials were coming from the coast and I should have an arrow coming down here to, to, to uh, Dolavira or Kutch, going from these regions all the way to Harappa, where we have evidence of shell use in the very earliest phase. Um, there is some shell evidence from sites a bit further to the north from Harappa, but so far Harappa has the best data for this early time period. Just to the south of Harappa is a site called Jalilpur. So before even excavating at Harappa, we knew that Jalilpur had um, materials, and this is the excavation at Jalilpur by Dr. Rafiq Mughal. Um, they found an ancient mound. In digging the mound, they were able to recover ceramics which date to the period prior to the Indus civilization. And these ceramics indicated that people had begun to establish small settlements. Uh, until our work at Harappa, we couldn't date it properly, but now we know that this is about 4000 BC, and we see the gradual emergence of small towns. Uh, Jalilpur is important because it has evidence of shell bank. Uh, this is some of the pottery, um, Cotdigian style pottery and um, polychrome pottery like we have at Harappa. Um, Jalilpur is important because it has evidence for shell bangles in its early layers. So we knew that from earlier excavations and uh, when we started working at Harappa that was one of the things that I wanted to look for. Jalilpur also has evidence of gold. So we have um, other materials, including shell, which indicates that certain types of ornaments were being developed and used as status indicators. Um, and clearly, uh, these small villages or towns in the Indus Valley were being connected with long distance trade networks. Gold would have been coming from the upper Indus region, and the shell is coming from the coast. So again, that connection between northern and southern trade networks in the middle of the Punjab. So in the context of discoveries from Jalilpur and a few other early Harappan sites, we began working at Harappa. And in 1986, we started excavating the site, uh, but it wasn't until um, around 1989 that we began really finding very good evidence for the earliest phases. And then in 2000, 2001, we continued excavation of these levels. So these are the earliest levels, which I've talked about here before, the Ravi phase at Harappa dating to about 20, uh, 3700 to 4000 BC. And one of the important discoveries from these levels was the discovery not only of shell bangles, which we had found already from Jalilpur, but unfinished shell fragments. So this indicates that unfinished, meaning raw shell, was being brought from the coast all the way to Harappa, 
and processed there and made into uh, ornaments. At Jalilpur, we just found the bangles. We didn't find any manufacturing waste. Uh, one of the important discoveries at, at Harappa in the Ravi phase was the presence of both wide bangles and thin bangles. And wide bangles, as I've talked about here before, I think reflect different uh, ethnic communities or different status groups within the society, maybe people who are doing more manual labor and can't afford to have their fragile bang bangles breaking. So thin shell bangles are not as uh, are, are fragile. They will break if you uh, smash them against a, a log or as you're chopping wood, uh, they, will, they will fracture. So people who were wearing thin bangles, even in the Ravi phase, were probably not doing a hot lot of manual labor or they were taking their bangles off when they did manual labor. And these manufacturing wastes indicate that people were making them at Harappa. Um, the, there are many other things that come along with bangles uh, at the, in the Ravi phase. I've talked about the beads and the seals and the ideology before, but I think that bangles continue to be, can, can be linked continually to uh, ideological symbols and not only status and wealth, but also some, some sort of belief relating to uh, uh, an individual's um, relationship to other people in their community and also to a larger uh, spiritual world. Uh, another important feature of these um, bangles is that they continue from the Ravi phase. We see them continuing into the later Kotdijian period. And on Kotdijian figurines, we have evidence of bangles all the way up the arms found on figurines. Now, we, don't have, we haven't found any burials from the Kotdijian phase, so we don't know what they, what they put on people when they, when they were dead or what they buried with them. But the figurines suggest that wearing bangles all the way up the arm became a tradition by the Kotdijian phase. And this tradition is still practiced in many parts of India. Uh, it's extremely awkward to be working with bangles all the way up your arm. And I've asked these women in Rajasthan, you know, why do you have to wear these? And they say, well, you know, it's just our tradition. We wear them and it's what we do and we know it's difficult and it's a pain trying to do any work with them, but it's what we do as a form of status and identification. So they are very familiar with the fact that it's not comfortable, uh, but they still wear them anyway. And today many of these bangles are replaced with, with, with ivory, I'll talk about that in a bit, and, uh, and then now I, um, plastic, but they are still continuing to be worn. Other types of ornaments that may reflect the continued use of some kind of head ornament or uh, shindur. We don't have any red, red in the parts of figurines from the Harappan period, but starting from the Ravi phase to the Kotdiji phase to the Harappan period, we have a very distinctive head ornament that's worn in the middle of the forehead, which is called a tika. So this, I think, continues that tradition that we saw beginning in Mehargar of shindur or something in the part of the head. Um, by the end of the Kotdiji phase, we have clear evidence for the emergence of a strong um, hierarchical society that uses seals to control power uh, and writing to uh, control knowledge, and that this is a part of a tradition um, that we, we see, it can trace from the Ravi phase all the way into the, Har to the Harappan period, uh, where we have also cubical weights for controlling uh, value and commodities. Uh, coming to the Indus period itself is when we see the m explosion and the, the high variety of shell uh, industries within the Indus civilization. And I did my studies, my, my um, dissertation research, at starting at the site of Balakot and looking at material from Aladino, Mohenjo-daro, Harappa, and I looked at Kalibangan material, I looked at material from uh, sites in Gujarat, uh, a site called Nageshwar was discovered when I was uh, by my colleague Kulip Ban, uh, when he was doing his work in Gujarat and then looking at material from Lothal. So these are the main sites that I looked at, but I had to travel all over Pakistan and India to get access to collections. So I ended up uh, going to many museums throughout the subcontinent and then diving along the coast because I wanted to find the sources of the shell. And I was able to do uh, snorkeling along this coast near Balakot, near Karachi, um, near uh, Dwarka here uh, in Kutch, and then around the coast of Gujarat. So this was an, an opportunity for me not just to hang out by the ocean, but to um, actually find the sources of where the shell was and to understand how ancient Harappans might have accessed this material. 
Uh, they didn't have uh, scuba equipment, so they only could snorkel. And uh, you can get these shells by snorkeling. But certain species can only be obtained by deep, deep water diving. So they were collecting some deep water shells and then some shells from the coast. And we can see that in the type of materials that was, were being recovered. Um, in this period is when we see the emergence of a strong hierarchical uh, elites with uh, long distance trade networks within the Indus Valley connecting the north and the south as well as trade to Mesopotamia and the Gulf region. And they controlled it with um, using uh, seals with writing on it. Uh, some of these symbols have been identified by people like Osco Parpola as representing circlets which may be bangles. I'm not going to go in that direction. Um, but so far I've never found a symbol that, would, that I could convincingly say is a conch shell, except for this, possibly this one. And this is, uh, again, too problematic to, to really associate with conch. So I don't see any, see any signs that I would argue is distinctively a conch shell shape, uh, but there must be one here because conch shells were very important for Indus people. Um, they control trade through their ceilings, and we, we see uh, we can trace many of their networks based on the seals, and I'll talk a bit about that when we look at some of the materials from the Gulf. The figurines from the, in, uh, the, uh, the Harappan phase continue to show bangles that are, you can see them in this fragment way up on the top of the arm, and there are bangles down the arm when we have lar longer uh, and well-preserved figurines. We also have elaborate headdresses which have different types of ornaments on them, including a tika in the middle of the forehead. So that continues on into the later period. Uh, we have hordes of jewelry, which indicate that some of the women and possibly men were, were collecting and using a lot of valuable metals and um, stone materials. And these elaborate headdresses, which are very distinctive for Indus figurines. Many of the beads that we found in the Indus Valley, these carnelian beads, have been found in Mesopotamia. One site where quite a few of them have been found is the site of Mari. And at Mari, we also have Mesopotamian versions of what I think is this headdress. So this suggests that there may have been Indus women in those sites in Mesopotamia. Um, so far, I haven't found any evidence of bangles, uh, shell bangles at the site of Mari, but we do have lots of, of, of the carnelian beads. The um, types of indications that I looked at when I was at Mohenjo-daro are trying to understand the organization of production of shell and what was being made at the site, what was being brought to the site from outside. Just by looking at the collections that had been, that been obtained in the, um, by the previous excavators, I was able to get a huge array of materials both from Harappa and Mohenjo-daro that provided evidence for every, to every variety of shell working uh, that could have happened at the site. One of the problems with the data that I was look, looking at was that it's, it wasn't chronologically segregated, so it was just from all the later phases of the site, and it's all mixed together. So when I went to Harappa, one of the goals was to see if I could see changes in technology over time, and that's what I'm still trying to analyze and figure out. So what I'm presenting here is basically a summary of an overview of the technologies that were used by the Indus and the types of materials that they uh, processed and what they did with them. Uh, these are fragments of that fingered conch shell or, tr or um, tr uh, Lambus truncata sibi. And the outer edge of the shell is extremely thick and heavy, and they would cut it off and saw it into planks and use that for making inlay and various other uh, types of objects. Even a ruler was made from this piece of shell. The turbinella pyrum is generally sawn at an angle. The tips were discarded and the sections that were left over that were big enough were then reused to make inlay and other types of objects. Um, this is a, a shell that had been broken to, to process and then never finished. And these are just pieces that never got recycled yet and they were in, stuck in workshops. So it was because of the amount of material that was being conserved in, for recycling and then getting lost in the process, it's possible to reconstruct all stages of manufacturing. Uh, another type of shell, which is a very um, spiny um, uh, shell, is called murex. They would grind the spines off and then make bangles out of them. And the murex bangles are very fragile and thin, and they can be distinguished from um, turbinella bangles. Uh, they use the fragments of murex for other things as well, but murex shell 
is not as white as the Turbinella pyrum. So it tends to yellow and it has a different uh, patterns on its surface. So generally speaking, people tried to use the Turbinella pyrum for bangles. A lot of the Turbinella shells themselves were recycled and used for making other objects, cones, figurines, and the central column of a Turbinella is extremely thick and large. And the size of these columns uh, made them op uh, uh, optimal for making uh, tubular beads and discs and uh, fragments of, of staffs that were then com made into composite staffs. And also, they were traded to Mesopotamia to make cylinder seals. So the solid columella of Harappan of uh, Turbinella pyrum was probably an important trade commodity going to Mesopotamia. And we have evidence of very thick and large Turbinella pyrum um, cylinder seals in Mesopotamia. Here are some examples of Lambus shell fragments. These are the leftovers of what they couldn't uh, deal with anymore. And then uh, grinding stones, which were associated with craft areas, which were where they would, would process them. And many different types of grinding stones have been found. Um, the presence of whitish powder, which is calcium powder from grinding of shell around certain grinding stones tells us that those were used for grinding shell. And I'll show you some ethnographic examples of how that accumulates. Um, here's some examples of the recycled pieces. So large flat pieces of, of lambus can be carved and made into special designs. Smaller pieces of turbinella pyrum uh, made into a comp a composite inlay. Every little fragment that could be used was being recycled because shell itself was valuable. It's coming from the sea. And then um, it was, it's strong enough that you can make very small items out of it. These were beveled and laid inlaid into wood or into other types of ornaments. The motifs that they have are things that are also found on pottery and in other types of jewelry. So ideological motifs relating to symbols of power and um, religious traditions that we can't interpret specifically, but clearly relate to um, symbols found on many other objects. Uh, wavy rings, which then get combined together to make a rod, uh, and then discs. And these types of discs were probably worn in the hair, on the uh, clothing, sewn onto clothing, and um, they, many of them have holes in the center, some of them have holes in the back like a button, and they are clearly being used as a, a decorative ornament. Um, some of the motifs on the shell can be also seen on seals, and this is a, a motif which I've called a, a womb motif, and it's a um, tradition that we see in later uh, alpana, or designs uh, painted on the floors, in later in historical times um, as a protective motif for something inside of this, this design. And it's found on unicorns as well as around unicorns, and here you have it being used for inlay. Probably the most important um, type of object that, that reflects ideology, besides just ornaments which can be used for decoration and just adornment as well, are what I call ritual utensils. The um, conch shell itself, with a hole in the front and the top, can, that is, can be used as a trumpet, is the earliest example of a wind instrument from the Indus civilization. Now, this was found from Harappa, and it suggests that they were using the conch trumpet as a form of uh, making uh, some kind of ritual um, call or, or sound. Conch today is used in many different traditions in South Asia. Uh, they also hollowed out the solid uh, spiral and all of the spi spires and inside of the conch shell and they did this primarily with the turbinella pyrum not with any other shell and they made an incised line around the opening which they filled with red ochre color so making a very distinctive red line around this opening and then they seem to have used it for pouring one of them has a double ring around the top with incised designs on the outside and one of these is found from Mohenjo-daro, and two of them are found from the site of Chanhudaro. So this is a tradition not just at one site, but at several sites, which indicate that shell was being used as a libation vessel, or what I would call a libation vessel. And this, uh, in later times, became referred to as a joloshunk, or a water shunk. The spiny murex is a much bigger shell that uh, was also being made into ladles, and the Harappans made very distinctive ladles that were kind of asymmetric because of the, the shape of the shell um, and they were making them out of this spiny murex. So they were grinding the outside, all the spines off, 
and I'll show you some pictures of those later. Uh, and then polishing it and then making this handled object. This one was found in a grave at Harappa. So it wasn't, uh, we've never found them um, in any temple or any special ritual spot. They've been found usually broken. But this one was the only one found in a very special context, so in a grave, laying uh, set on a uh, small platter. And in the center of it, it has a piece of lead that had been used to fill a hole. Because the murex lives in certain reefs, worms attack the shell and drill holes through the shell, and many of the shells have holes in them. So this one, after they made this beautiful ladle, they realized, well, there's a couple little holes in this ladle, and it's not going to be able to hold any water or whatever they were going to hold it, put in it. So they took lead, which is very easily melted, and they just poured lead onto that ho hollow hole and made a rivet out of lead. Unfortunately, the, the lead corrodes and eventually split, so it broke the whole shell later on in, as it was buried. But this ladle is a very distinctive Harappan ladle. It was never made in any other region in antiquity. So this is where I'm going to come to um, some connections between Harappa and outside regions. And this is a new discovery that was just sent to me by email uh, two weeks ago. Um, Harappa, the Indus civilization, is spread over this wide area from the Makran coast, they should have put the green all the way to there, um, down to, to Gujarat and almost Bombay. Um, in this region we have cultures emerging which we refer to as Magan, but Magan is also on the other side of the coast, so either both sides of the coast can be called Magan. And a new region which has been identified as Marhashi is in southeastern Iran uh, in a site called Jiroft. Uh, Dilmun is an important region that includes um, Bahrain and all the way to Kuwait in terms of the cultural traditions that are found there. And it's a, a region that was, would have been along the trade networks. And then you have Mesopotamia and Elam. So Elam is in southwestern Iran and then Mesopotamia in the southern in the Tigris Euphrates. We have texts from, the, from Mesopotamia that talk about trade with Dilmun, Magan, and Meluha. So Meluha is the Indus, presumed to be the Indus Valley, and we know that things relating to the sea were coming. So possibly pearls, shell, carnelian, monkeys, peacocks, things, uh, shisham wood, dark wood that would be available from the Indus Valley. Um, Historically, the, some Swedish scholars were able to identify Dilmun and Bahrain as Dilmun uh, because of discovery of burial mounds in this region, and they've been the major scholars working there. Magan is being explored uh, contemporaneously with that, and, con and currently there are many excavations going on here trying to locate, and they have found Harappan sites in Magan. So what's important about the most recent discoveries is that uh, many of the burial mounds have been now excavated and properly analyzed. And in the mounds themselves, there is pottery, which some of it is very similar to pottery found in Gujarat. And Gujarat is where you have clear evidence of mining or collecting sh from the sea uh, shell ornaments and, or shell for trade to the, to the west. Um, these burial mounds also have Mesopotamian pottery, so there's stuff going in both directions. But one of the interesting features about some of the earliest burial mounds are that they have a spoked shape, which has um, recently been reported by Stefan Larsen uh, in his dissertation research. This type of burial mound is found also on Dolo, at Dolavira, associated with the Harappan period. And it's a very unique structure. Nobody figured out how, what, what it was doing there and where it might have come from. Uh, Dr. Bisht, who's excavated it, argues that this is a very good Harappan uh, context and that the pottery itself is Harappan and not late Harappan, meaning it's probably from 2400 to 2200 BC, <coughs> which would roughly date to the time period just before these were being found in Bahrain. So it suggests that if they were earlier in, D in Dolavira and then in the Bahrain, it would mean that these people were from Dolavira coming to Bahrain and establishing their tradition there. We don't know this yet. This is just a theory that's been suggested. It could be that they're coming the other way. So it may be that people from Bahrain came to Dolavira and had their burial traditions there, but they were Harappans. They buried with Harappan pottery. They, buried, they didn't have any Mesopotamian pottery at all. And then I got an email that they found this shell, which is clearly a murex ladle Harappan style, 
in a house dating to the Ur III period, which is around 22, 2100 BC, in Phylacha, which is uh, in Kuwait, so just off of Kuwait, a small island. This island didn't exist before 2200 BC. It came out of the sea and emerged, and people settled on it. And the people who settled on that island are clearly people from Bahrain. They're not Mesopotamians coming down there and, and occupying an island but there are people from Bahrain or Dilmun moving that direction to take over trade ne networks to Mesopotamia. The pottery that's being found there is being studied by a guy named Hassan Ashkanani, who I'll be on his dissertation committee. He's going to be in Madison this coming spring. And they have a lot of pottery that looks like Gujarati pottery in, in Phylaka. And discovery of this ladle in one of the houses suggests that there is clear linkage to the Indus Valley and shell trade through Dilmun to Phylaka, and then on into Mesopotamia. So I'm really excited about this and um, hope that we can find more evidence to link Gujarat to this Gulf trade to Mesopotamia. Uh, coming back to bangles, I want to talk a little bit about the technology of bangle making, uh, because bangle making itself and the use of shell to make bangles is quite complex. Uh, it's very easy to take clay and make a little circlet, and you can make bangles out of clay. So the earliest bangles of the Indus Valley were made with clay. Uh, but they also made them out of fans, of stoneware, of gold, of bronze, and, um, then all, and then shell. So shell bangles were probably not the first thing that they made. They may have made them out of clay or even stone. But eventually, people decided to make shell bangles out of shell. So how do you do that? Um, you can take a shell like the shell from Marigar and cut the top off and cut the back off and hollow it out and you'll have one big bangle. But if you want to economize and make more than one bangle out of a shell, you have to develop a specialized technology for doing this. And that's what we see emerging during the Indus cities. So they were taking a raw material which you can easily make one bangle out of by chipping and grinding and developing a highly specialized technology using bronze saws to first chip and hollow out the center cut at an angle, slice into multiple circlets, grind, chip, polish, and eventually end up with bracelets that can be worn and not poke you as you're wearing them. So making a bangle itself became it's a, a very complicated technology that was being um, perfected and used by uh, urban elites to create uh, items of value. And this is where my work at Balakot was kind of um, uh, important because at Balakot I found bangles that were from the Indus cities, but I also found a bunch of bangles that were clearly not made by saws. And George Dales got tired of looking at all these shells and said, well, you go take them and play with them. And so I sat there and took ancient shells, because we didn't have any ones, other ones, and ground them and chipped them and replicated the ancient process to understand how the ancient people were making them. So these were probably the earliest bangles made in the Indus Valley. But can, they continue to be made all the way into the urban phase. Because anybody can go to the, the, the coast, pick up a clamshell, grind it, chip it, and make it a bangle. But turbinella pyram bangles have to be made by specialized workshops controlled by elites, because it's requiring bronze technology. So I propose that there may have been two parallel economies going on, where some people were making these things, uh, continuing an ancient tradition, and then a modern tradition emerges, which takes over the market. We've been able to trace this type of bangle, which is called a Tivola damoides uh, shell. Um, one bangle fragment of this was found in Lotal. One was found in the site of Aladino. And you can de define it by their, 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 their stria. So some people wearing these bangles continue to be important in Indus civilization, even into the later period. And they identify themselves and distinguish themselves by wearing clamshell bangles versus turbinella pyram bangles. To better understand the technology, I went to Bengal. And uh, since I grew up in Bengal, it was fun to go back and hang out. And most recently, I went to Dhaka and got to see the Shankaris in Dhaka, where I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to go during my Fulbright as a, as a graduate student. And um, I was able to see one of the largest conch shells I've ever seen. I didn't think they get that, got that big. But this is a humongous shell from Sri Lanka that was um, being marketed. I mean, you couldn't make a bangle. I said, what do you, you can't, no woman has an arm that big to wear bangles that big. She says, we make them for the goddess. So they only make these 
large shells for the goddess and they're used for special rituals. In Bengal, they use all the little ones for the goddess because no w women have hands that are so small, so they make all the little shell bangles and put them on little figurines. So it's a very interesting difference between the two regions. <coughs> shell is cut with a large saw called the korat, and I won't go into all of the history of this that's in the literature. Um, it's chipped out the same way that we were able to reconstruct archaeologically. Uh, we have distinctive <coughs> tools and then sawn into circlets uh, with, this, with this saw. Modern shell, sawing, s shell manufacturers use electric saws which vibrate a lot and then they crack the shell so they're very fragile and they have to be reconstituted with, uh, with epoxy. So they don't buy any modern shells. They uh, dip them in epoxy so that it fills all the cracks so they don't break. The, ancient, the old ones made with a korat are the, the stronger ones. Um, they were ground on flat stones just like we found at Manjadaro and the area around the shell grinding area is just a thick layer of calcium deposits. And I found exactly the same deposits in Balakot near a shell working area and we've seen them in Manjadaro. So when you, when you find a grindstone in a shell working area you can identify it by that calcium. Um, grinding the inside was a special type of uh, mandrel and then carving designs. This is a huge collection of old bangles found in Dhaka. Nobody wants to buy old bangles anymore. So I'm saving my pocket money and when I go back to Dhaka I'm going to buy them all because they have the old, they're made with the old hand, hand saw and they're carved with the old designs and all they have to do is be bleached to make them white again and they will be very beautiful uh, bangles. Uh, the saw technique that I studied in Bengal is um, I measured every uh, a bunch of shells to see how deep it cut and the sawing technique of the Indus Valley was as effective as the modern steel saws. Now the Indus people did not have steel. They had bronze and we've never found an Indus saw for cutting shell but by looking at the manufacturing techniques and measuring them, I was able to confirm that the Indus saws were as effective as modern steel saws for cutting the shell. So that means that Indus had much harder bronze than we ever imagined, and that we have to figure out how that bronze was created. Um, Indus uh, figurines show bangles all the way up the arm, but in the graves, they're only found, <coughs> only shell bangles are found. So many of the bangles that would have been worn by Indus women were clearly not all shell. They may have been gold or silver or faience or terracotta. They took all those bases off, but they left the shell ones on for the burials. And that's what led me to think that these shell bangles and burials are clearly associated with an ideology associated possibly with uh, ethnic status or an acquired status that you would get as you become older. They're always found with older women, never with uh, juvenile women, and they seem to be, I, I think, associated with probably marriage. Um, the bangles are different sizes and um, many b women have three of them or four of them or five of them. There's not any special number that they have, um, so there's no pattern exactly of how, how many would be worn. Um, and some of the later burials have a large number. This one had 13 bangles on her arm and they were all very fine and thin bangles that were very fragile. And this led me, in, and I've talked about this before, to argue that over time the women in the cemetery became less and less involved in manual labor, that they could wear very fragile ornaments and not have to do work that would, would cause these ornaments to break. But when, men also wore bangles and this, fa this uh, burial of a male had one fragment of a shell bangle under one of the wrists. We didn't, it wasn't complete so we weren't able to get all the whole thing and a, uh, under his head was an ornament made of thousands of tiny beads and two shell bangles. So bangles were also worn in the hair. So when we find little bangles, we don't have to assume that they were used for child brides or people with very small hands, but they could have been hair ornaments and worn in other parts of the body. And in the cemetery, we also, outside of the cemetery, we also find the very, very hard, wide bangles. So the tradition that started at, at um, Mehargar of having huge bangles some women wearing them and then continuing in the Ravi phase uh, continues on into the Harappan period and I think it relates to probably communities that are distinctive from those being buried in that cemetery and it suggests that there may have been many com competing elites 
in the in the cities. And I realize I'm going a bit long, so I'm going to wind it up here quickly. Uh, some trade networks. Uh, I mean, these are some of the boats that may have been used for going out to to dive from, and then network uh, boats for trade in the Indus Valley, uh, moving shells from the Indus to other regions. Um, I was just going to run through some sites. This is I'll go through them quickly. We have uh, evidence of sites, uh, uh, shell bangles in the upper Indus Valley at the sites such as um, in Sindh, uh, which recently discovered in um, uh, central Indus, and then from Kalibangan in the upper Indus. And these bangles are often found with, in association with terracotta bangles. Um, recent excavations at Farmana shows bangles being worn uh, on both arms, on the right hand as well as the left hand, which is a different from Harappa suggesting that many different, there may have been multiple bangle traditions being used. Um, there's a, a shell disc with the incised design, so shells continue to be used as hair ornaments. The site of Ganvedivala, which is in the middle of the desert, not excavated yet, found large areas of shell bangle manufacturing in that area, and suggesting that shells were being processed in all of the major cities. And then Balakot, where I started my work, um, the shell workshop was on this part of the site, and associated with it were pottery from Baluchistan and Makran, which is, goes across to Magan, and this kind of ties in with the stuff I talked about earlier of trade networks connecting to Bahrain and Dilmun. Most of the shell from Balakot um, were from Turbinella Pyram, um, and we also, but we also have the spondylus, which is what was used to make the tiny beads from Mergar and Konus shells, which were also found at Marigar. Um, at Aladino, which was a very small settlement, uh, we have very important wealth items <coughs> being found there and evidence for shells being used by the elites of that settlement, but no, no clear indication of workshops. So some small sites got shell bangles in finished form, whereas others, other sites were processing them. And I'm going to end with a few s slides from Gujarat, which kind of outline some important discoveries, starting with Nageshwar to Bagasara to Shikarpur, uh, which some of you may have seen already uh, in the talks that were given in recent conferences. But Nageshwar is where we first found the largest manufacturing center for shells back in 1981. Um, when we first located it, we were just dumbfounded. We had never seen so many shells in one place. More shells than all of the Harappa and Manjadara sites found together and all manufacturing waste. So very few finished pieces, mainly just debris. And this was a, clearly a processing center for making rough outs. They had a lot of rough bangles from Turbinella Pyram as well as Murex. And then shell ladle manufacture, but no ladles. So they had all the unfinished pieces, but none of the finished pieces at the site. Clearly moving things to the um, major urban centers. Bagasara or Goladoro, which is just up the Gulf, was excavated by uh, MS University Baroda, and they found clear evidence for a huge shell workshop in one part of the site. And this workshop had multiple periods of stockpiling of shell and a large basket, square box or basket, filled with thousands of shell bangles, all, all, almost all unfinished. And so this box full of shell bangles was clearly being prepared for shipment or preparation for movement out of the region. Why was this workshop abandoned? We don't know. So, the, so far the excavators have not come up with any explanation for why somebody would walk away and leave a workshop filled with thousands and thousands of very valuable items in it. Um, what the Harappans also, I mean, in their collection, these guys were collecting so many shells that they, they may have been netting them from the bottom. So just kind of pulling nets on the bottom of the sea, pulling all these shells up and dumping them in piles and letting them putrefy and then getting ready to work them. This would have been a very stinky workshop. Um, but what was really interesting was in that pile of shells, there was one shell that was sinistral. So sinistral means it goes to the left. Almost all, most of the shells go to the right and one of them goes to the left. And in my shell studies, the sinistral shells are the most valuable of any shell. They go for 100, 100 lakhs if you find them today. And they're used for special rituals in later Hindu tradition. 
and if you are washed with uh, water from uh, one of these shells, you will gain release from all your rebirths uh, without any problem. So this is considered to be a very valuable shell. And I will end there because I don't want to uh, I go over too much, but thank you all for listening, and I hope that you learned something new about shell industries. Uh, there's more to come, and when I get done with my Harappa data, and I'll, I'll bring another summary at some other future time. Thanks. Only three of them have been found in the entire Indus Valley. Right. Okay. And so, and they're found um, with very, you know, re red design painted in them, so that's very specialized. Mm -hmm. uh, they could have been for feeding cows or for giving medicine, which is some of them are used for today. Right. Um, but you'd expect a lot more of them, and you'd expect if everybody was using them to have clay versions and other versions. So I think they were just, this was the beginning of a tradition that later on became clearly um, associated with ideology. And today, I mean, Yudhishthir is anointed with a shell vessel in the Mahabharata, like that. Um, so they become important in later periods. Thank you. Yeah. Any idea how a Dravidian name gets worked into something which is so crazy? That's my next talk. I'll talk next about it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have a whole thing about the uh, continuities between the Indus Valley and later Jain, Buddhist, and Hindu traditions. So that was the uh, part of my dissertation which I have been waiting for as a second edition, second volume. So there's a huge, huge dip body of data on that. Since then, great. Okay. Yeah, so there's, I mean, the Brahmanical traditions borrowed the use of shell from the Indus Valley. Yeah. So in a nutshell, there's no word for shell in the Vedas. Yeah. The shell does not occur in any of the early literature or mantras or anything. And it's only during the Mahabharata period that shell becomes common and it's clearly being adopted from Indus period sites. And actually earlier period when Krishna takes over Gujarat, conquers Gujarat, he destroys the Panchajana and the Panchajana is represented by a shank, which is that five-fingered whelk, which becomes his conch shell. Yeah, I have, it's not a question, it's a statement. I had looked forward to this talk, and what I learned is that, because I have collected these shank haphazardly, but I do have one that opens on the right, and from tomorrow I'm going to pour Ganges water on my <laughs> No, they, go, they all open to the right. It's the, the one that goes to the left. The, it's, called the, uh, it's called Bama Varta is the right, right. Dakshina Varta is the left. So, okay, right. Well, yeah. the, it opens the other way. I've yeah. never paid attention to them, but I have just collected them. And uh, I don't know where I found it. 100 locks according to Mark. So yeah. I don't want to say that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't need it. They make the, there, there are ones that turn to the left. You can buy them in, in uh, anywhere in the New World. They're, they're very common in um, the, the Caribbean. So in India, people sell them for a lot of money. So if you go to Bombay and try to buy a Caribbean whelk that turns to the left, you may pay a lot of money for it. But um, they're very common in America. So I think it just the, this magnetic patterns of the Caribbean result in shells turning both ways easier. It's, it's said that you know you really have to know a lot to make it accessible for lay people. You do that so well, Mark, so please uh, join me in thank you.